morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramp, usher you in, uh, you guys, into uh, Friday, February 12th. I pre-recorded this on Friday, February 11th, so a lot of my news is from Wednesday and Thursday morning, so uh, bear with me if I miss a, cu a couple things that are going on here as well, because as of today... Friday, uh, the mask mandate for the state of Montana has been lifted by Greg Gianforte, along with a shield that would protect uh, small and uh, uh, local uh, Montana businesses uh, from being uh, liable for spreading coronavirus. So let's talk a little bit more about this. Uh, early Wednesday, G Greg Gianforte, Governor Greg Gianforte, signed a bill that would shield small businesses, churches, health care providers, and other organizations from lawsuits associated with COVID-19. Part of this was to leave it to the individual to decide whether or not to mask up. Vaccines have been distributed throughout nursing homes and many other health care workers. Uh, Missoula, uh, in terms of uh, Masking. Um, I'm assuming they're going to keep on uh, keeping on with the mask mandate. Just a hunch. Um, as long as businesses can use the old uh, no mask, no service, uh, they can still do that pretty much. Um, this was uh, from the Helena's Independent uh, Record, and we have some news from the CDC just recently just dropped. Uh, February 2nd saw a mandate on planes, buses, trains, and other public transport transportation traveling into, within, or out of the U.S., as well as the U.S. transit hubs such as airports and stations. The double mask is recommended for those single-use masks over surgical or cloth masks. They did a cough study to determine how much uh, uh, of that uh, the water droplets, which carries the COVID, can get spread through certain masks. You know, those little uh, thin paper masks, uh, surgical masks, They've determined if you just double up, you have a lesser chance of spreading any kind of germs from your cough as well. So um, I don't want to sound too, I don't know too much about like the science behind the mask, but I just assume that if you can't feel your breath on your hand when you're wearing a mask, then you should be okay. But that's, that's just me. I don't want you to <laughs> take that to the bank. Uh, the only thing that you can do do, uh, in terms of like, if you're wondering about the CDC powers, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the rights um, in, in, in times of a pandemic and COVID, uh, the special report later on in the show that will talk a little bit more about this. But the CDC has the right to detain a medically examine and release persons arriving into the United States and traveling between states who are suspected of carrying those communicable diseases. But since the spread is too large, it would be kind of pointless. And this is under Code 42, Code of Federal Regulations, Parts 70 and 71. Uh, these are usually in terms of like um, major quarantine and stuff like, stuff like that. Of course, like I said today in my show, uh, Mansfield Dialogues invited people from across the state of Montana and all political spectrums, um, business owners as well, to talk about how the uh, pandemic has affected them and how uh, the laws moving forward and how uh, they're reacting to um, certain mask restrictions being lifted in the area. So I'll talk a little bit about, bit about that as well. But I also wanted to mention that kids are going back to school on a four-day week in the Missoula County Public Schools. So far, many of the 2020 kindergarten classes aren't ready and have missed out on many important teachings that would have made them ready for, first, uh, for kindergarten. Uh, this was developed by a California company called Applied survey research an assessment was made for kindergarten students that showed 45 percent of children were fully ready for kindergarten in the areas of self-expression self-regulation and academics many of the kids 70 percent began early education preschool a lot of kids do go to preschool uh there's always a kind of like a mixed learning environment for a lot of kids who whose parents are going back to work and they need a place and a lot of times they have an educational component for them so this really does help them along the way but with the uh uh, COVID that happened, uh, many of the kids had to be at home and they missed out on a lot of learning. Some parents uh, stepped up, uh, others were trying to figure out a way uh, to get back to work and also find a place for their kids to stay. The goal of this is to uh, administer a grant funded assessment in all of the Missoula County's 54 kindergarten classrooms and use the data to advocate for funding at the local and state level for services and resources that help prepare kids for kindergarten such as publicly funded preschool to assist teachers. The full story is from the Missoulian article, you can read it, it's by Cameron Evans and some of this coverage I did at uh, the school board meetings that I've seen so you guys can get involved. Um, through school board, they, which happens every second and fourth Tuesday of the month starting at 6 p.m. Moving on, we have a great show for you guys. We got pre critic, we got new dub and stuff, but let's show you guys a little taste of what you can expect for this weekend from the Zootown Arts Community Center, 
social distancing sessions. Here is Cowboy Andy uh, and friends. This is the one. Third one. The trucker on the road just spilled a heavy load and his truck it almost rolled off the highway. Well, he's 55 years old and his things have all been sold and his fingertips are cold as an ice tray. Ah, but his radio, radio, radio works fine. So he ain't got no troubles on his mind. And the farmer in the and the miner in the shaft just lost his better half. And on top of that, she kidnapped their daughter. Well, he never did learn math, and he never found a path, and he'll probably never do what he ought to. Ah, but his radio, radio, radio works fine, so he ain't got no reason why. Well, And the farmer in the field didn't get no yield, so he can't afford Blue Shield for his grandma. So he grew some marijuana in his farthest field, and it was well concealed till his little brother squealed, and the income was revealed. And of course, of course he appealed, but the judge said, no deal. Sent him to Mobile, Alabama. Hard times in America. Ah, but his radio, radio, radio works fine. So he ain't got no troubles on his mind. He ain't got no reason why. Wind it up. Radio works fine, boys. Helps me pass the time. Girls from Arkansas to Illinois in all kinds of weather. My tape deck makes a fine noise. Fast forwards and rewinds, girls. I think Charlie Pride and the Beastie Boys should come together. Desegregate their ways. Please, my radio, radio, radio works fine. So I ain't got no troubles on my mind. I ain't got no reason why I ain't got no troubles on my mind I ain't got no reason why Hey everybody, welcome back. It's time for me to talk a little bit about movies and games and entertainment things that are coming out this week that you can probably pass on. It's time for a pre-critic or a pre-judging movie, whether it needs it or not. Judas and the Black Messiah. Hey, this movie is about the Black Panthers. Don't judge. Another movie comes along that plays a heavy-handed drama that is racism. Judas and the Black Messiah is a movie that I assume is, has a man who speaks to the generation only to be betrayed by the ones closest to them. Hence, Judas... Uh, because of the Bible and all that stuff. Uh, this is the story of the Black Panthers who took more towards Malcolm's X speeches like, we are nonviolent to those who are nonviolent to us. This follows your group as they arm themselves to defend their rights. This is about um, the Black Panthers and the FBI bullying a black man saying that you will go to jail unless you infiltrate the Black Panthers for us. And then, you know, it's like, I don't know if I can betray this person. And then since it's Judas, you, you most likely it's going to be some kind of betrayal and and it's going to end pretty badly. 
moving on. Uh, another tale of finding one's identity amid the pressures of conforming to the white beard American ideals. Uh, white bread, sorry, white beard, whatever. Uh, this one comes from a Korean American family who moves to a small town. Uh, okay, I know where this is going. Let me guess, they go to a small town and they're not accepted by the community, but through hard work and dedication, they learn that people are just like them. As long as they are hardworking, uh, the kids get bullied at school because they're different, um, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the police start harassing them. He's like, you don't, you're not from around here, are you? And then blah, 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 other things. And, um, <laughs> and then he's like, my daddy fought in Korea, the Korean War. It's your fault. Where, where's the thank you? And all that kind of stuff. This movie will probably have them standing up for the values and people in town being like, huh, I never thought of it that way and so on and so forth, uh, providing, raising, and protecting their family. There's a lot of, we never saw it that way, and uh, my favorite, actually, actually, this actually doesn't look so bad because Steven Yuen is in it, and he is amazing, and that's the reason why I stopped watching The Walking Dead is because they killed him, spoiler. <laughs> Up next, we got a video game that's coming out. It's called Little Nightmares. Um, you're basically playing as a, uh, a little tiny protagonist, a humanoid, in a world full of uh, human-esque monsters who want to kill you. So the, movie, the this is a sequel to a game of the same kind of venture where you climb on things and you avoid things and you hide in the darkness and you try not to get killed. So that just happened. Uh, this is a game for you. You can uh, play it and watch playthroughs if you want to figure out how to beat the game. Your downscale frame will have to get through the monsters, all shapes and all sizes, along climbing filing cabinets. <laughs> Uh, or, yeah, and so on and so forth. So this, this game just supposes to help pass the time and give you nightmares. So it's kind of nightmare fuel for the nightmare bus and so on and so forth. Up next, uh, sorry punks, it's uh, something a little softer. It's dubbing stuff from the 1951 movie, Two Dollar Better. And then after that, I'm going to talk about some city council and that special uh, report that I have from the Mansfield Dialogue. So stay with me. Hmm. Uh -huh. I probably shouldn't drink alone. Thanks for coming over. Traffic was short. I made every light. They were green, so I can go through traffic. Uh, yeah, toast to uh, hitting <laughs> all the green lights. Mmm, <laughs> this is very delicious. Did your wife want one? No, she's the responsible one. Mm, maybe I should be more responsible. I was driving the other day, and I saw a big fluffy dog, and I was like, someday, Brian, someday. But it was not meant to be. Sure, I could steal it and care for it. Love it, even. Well, I'm bored. I think we're gonna head out, right, wife? Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm just really happy that you have a lot of those pictures of dogs on the wall. It makes me think that, why don't you have a dog? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit complicated. Well, maybe we'll head on over some more when it's less complicated. Y'all come back now, you hear? Uh, stupid. God, that was stupid. Hmm. 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> boop a doop boop boop. Seven, seven, twelve, forty-two. Whew. Hey, I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready to buy a dog. Oh, well that's wonderful. What kind of breed were you thinking? Perhaps a mix? A mix of two different kinds of breeds? Uh breeds can mix? I'm um I'm a little bit overwhelmed here. I I think I might pass this time. I'll, I'll call back when I'm ready. <sighs> Hi, Mom. I, I couldn't get that dog. So earlier this month, uh, on Monday, the city council met to talk about a lot of things moving forward, and one of the things that they talked about was a proclamation that talks about missing and, and murdered indigenous uh, missing and murdered indigenous women in the form of a proclamation. Here is Mayor John Engen talking about that. Ladies and gentlemen, whereas the city of Missoula joins with Canada to spur awareness in Montana, the Great Plains region, and the United States for murdered and missing indigenous women, and whereas there is not a comprehensive estimate of indigenous women who are missing and murdered in the United States, but many factors contribute to this crisis, such as fear, 
stigma, legal barriers, racism, sexism, and the devastating levels of violence in the United States. And whereas nearly half of all Native American women in the United States have been raped, beaten, or stalked by an intimate partner, they are 2.5 times more likely to experience sexual assault. One in three will be raped in her lifetime. And on some reservations, women are murdered at a rate 10 times higher than the national average. And whereas for more than 30 years, there have been awareness raising efforts uh, in Canada on Valentine's Day and the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women's Awareness Day seeks to build support by increasing awareness in the United States. And whereas there has been an increase in human trafficking in Montana due to increased oil activity in the Bakken region, as well as in all areas of the state. On June 15th, 2018, Jermaine Charlo went missing here in Missoula and investigators believe she may have been kidnapped. Jermaine remains missing. Now, therefore, I, John Ingen, Mayor of the City of Missoula, do hereby proclaim Sunday, February 14th, as Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women Awareness Day in Missoula. Part of this goes in conjunction with Valentine's Day. This is a, a proclamation that's been read many, many years and many times, And but this is just as important because domestic violence among Indigenous women are four and five. We're four and five, which includes uh, Eskimos up in Alaska, Indigenous women of all uh, many different areas, 83%. Uh, uh, and this is from their website uh, for uh, baya.gov, where they talk about this a little bit more. And 83% uh, experience some form of violence in their lifetime. So that's really high. And it's the fifth leading cause of death is homicide. That only scratches the surface because a lot of the injustice is in the aftermath where there's not much justice for the people who have gone missing or have been murdered. There needs to be a better partnership with the U.S. and sovereign nation lands as the, that we enjoy as well. So far, the state of Montana has launched a program in 2019 that uh, Montana Missing Indigenous People Task Force, a program in the Montana Department of Justice with the goal of opening communication between jurisdictions handling MMIP cases like state, county, tribal, and federal officials can work together. This session saw an um, extension of that program, the uh, Montana legislature, but any expansion of the funds uh, have kind of been shot down and so far they're gonna continue this program, but you know, there's only so much money they're putting into this. Of course, for more information, you can go to BIA.org, that's B-I-A.org to find out Indian affairs from the federal government. Moving on, Scott Street Properties, this is one of the biggest affordable housing projects in the state of Montana, and it's going to cover about 77% of the new housing that uh, Montana was uh, looking towards in the five-year plan. So Montana, a lot of people wanted to move to Missoula, and in Missoula, uh, they had a plan to be like, oh, we need to have X amount of houses in five years. And so this Scott Street project is going to cover 77% of that, which is a pretty big chunk. Uh, so, oh, sorry, I misspoke. It's not 77%, it's 70%, just so you know. Uh, you can learn more information about the, on this on the Missoulian as well, but also the city talked a little bit more about this as the city invested in these sites a few years back when it was an industrial zone, but with the rezoning cleaning up, they turned this into a residential and some of the area was turned to a residential commercial mix for opportunities in the future. The city council member that uh, of that ward, Brian Von Lossberg, reflects on this area. It's the neighbor's vision for the integration of commercial, industrial, and residential uses attempts to balance the need for jobs, services, and neighborhood economic stability with the equally pressing need for healthy residential neighborhoods. And whereas the neighborhood plan encourages an appropriate mix of residential and commercial activities that protects the residential character of the neighborhoods and honors the traditional coexistence of residential, small business, and light industrial uses. So. In, the memo, in the memo that uh, Brian Van Lossberg read it, read, it stated that this area was only intended for commercial use and industrial site, and no one would want to live in an area so close to the railroad tracks. This member also stated the uh, transit population and it's better to leave this area be. Uh, the residents of the north side also had a vision for this area to help bolster this process. And if any reflection of that uh, site su south of this site, there's a, another development that developed off of Scott Street, which is just south of this 
kind of vacant area as well has already been developed into a housing area which works and it looks really beautiful and it looks great and so there that was a good uh first step moving forward with this new property gwen joan talks about uh the local development and then i'm really pleased that we have a, a local developer who just has certain values they really want to implement through this project in terms of affordable housing and creating a community. Um, and, and all of that goes, all of these different moving parts have gone into creating this great project that I'm, I'm so happy about. And I, I think we talk so much about affordable housing. It's such a huge issue. Um, but this project creates affordable housing but it does so much more. It creates homes, it creates communities because it's thoughtful design. Um, it's going to incorporate some uh, intentional commercial components that create a good community. It's going to incorporate some childcare facility that will uh, really help the quality of life. So it's, it's not just creating more units, it's really creating a wonderful livable environment, which I think is something we've got to keep in mind with all of our affordable housing projects. We don't always have these tools at our disposal, um, but it's all coming together beautifully in this project. And I'm just so pleased. Um, so the total area they're going to be using is 19 acres of land, which will range from 24 to 43 units of homes on each uh, acre. The, uh, the motion passed with nine votes and uh, three absents. Um, Sarah Vis uh, Sandra Vasecki talks about gun safety and how important it is for schools to teach. It was a concern of some of my council members that this was overstepping our jurisdiction. I do disagree on that due to the fact that this resolution is purely saying that the city backs these programs if schools choose to incorporate them. It's not required of them. The city council has many other times asked other governmental organizations to support or encourage or to do certain things. For example, the council asked the Missoula County Commission to adopt a local option motor fuel excise tax. This was not requiring the county to do anything, it was purely asking them. The council requested distribution of bridge and road safety accountability program funds from the Montana Department of Transportation. This is not forcing the DOT to do anything, it was purely a request. The council supported Congress's land and water conservation fund. This is purely a resolution showing their support. The council asked the Missoula County election administrator to certain dates and provide ballot boxes. Again, this is not requiring the election administrator to do anything. If my safety resolution is overstepping our jurisdiction by supporting the Be Safe and Hunter Safety programs, then it can be argued that all of those previous resolutions of support to other jurisdictions, such as Missoula County and Congress, are overstepping as well. Okay, I know I kind of started that with a clip right there, but I wanted to kind of give a little bit of background. Sign for Sexy's the motivation behind this is to kind of provide a safety course for gun safety for a lot of kids and moving forward. But a lot of uh, city council members were kind of taken aback with this. Um, and it is, it is an important educational program, but for a lot of the city council members, how uh, to them and what you're going to hear is that they, uh, they thought the approach and the, the information that Sandra Verstecki was looking into was not the kind of information that they want to move forward on. And so this is Brian von Loschberg who is reflecting on this. Um, this, this issue of jurisdictional uh, boundary, I, uh, I wouldn't describe it as a jurisdictional issue. This speaks to, this resolution speaks to um, curriculum, stuff that takes place in the classroom, stuff that would take place in the classroom with my third grade student uh, in that classroom. And I, I, I don't know how to uh, make it any more clear that there is a distinction uh, between what this political body does in all of those examples that were presented uh, and educational curriculum matters that are uh, properly vetted through the district and the school board and their processes for educational consideration. Um, so Brian Von Losberg said that continue that schools may choose to support gun safety and that the city body, um, but says the words matter and hopes that something like this can have a better approach rather than set a curriculum in the classroom. Overall, this was supposed to send a letter of support for gun safety in schools um, and let schools decide, but it ultimately failed in council. Uh, here's just a few safety tips. Um, that I learned through hunter safety as well. Keep your guns locked away and away from children. And most of all, treat all guns as if they were loaded and always check to see if they are when handling one. Um, also unload all guns unless 
you have an intention to shoot. So if you are handed a gun, you always check if it's loaded. And if it is, take the take everything out and make sure it's out of the chamber. Um, and a lot of times, you sh if you don't feel comfortable, you should just leave the situation altogether. And, you know, it's just the way it is. Um, but let's not talk a little, a little about this. It's it's always there's always a lot of there's a huge spectrum of issues when it comes to gun safety and all that stuff, and it's been heavily politicized. I don't want to talk about too too much, so we're going to skip ahead, and you can watch this meeting and learn more about what they were talking about. But I just wanted to glaze over this. Um, so, so right now the city is actually moving to purchase some more land for office space for their uh, for the um, Montana. Uh, city, the city water company. It's kind of really hard to say with the flow because it's Missoula City of Water, and that's their company, the former Mountain Water Company, which the city acquired, and now they're uh, looking to buy some more land so they can expand some office space for the water company. The city council member Stacy Anderson talks about this, and this is what she had to say: that the way in which we are purchasing this is utilizing. Um, enterprise funds and you know if you haven't spent time in public uh, works or on council sometimes it may be like well what's enterprise funds what's general funds where's my tax dollars go this is the uh fees collected for the service provided by turning on your tap and getting missoula water and because we own it as a public utility and not a private company who's beholden to paying shareholder dividends we have money to reinvest reinvest in waterline expansion maintenance as well as providing additional office space to better serve the public so since the acquisition of the water company, the city has been seeing some capital um, money and enterprise funds to help move forward with purchasing of uh, new equipment, being able to improve the pipe system and maintenance moving forward and expansion. Uh, part of some of the issues that have come up in the city's ventures into real estates. Um, but on the other hand, it also provides the city and by proxy residents to have and say in what these areas become in the future. Uh, people tend to forget that the city is an extension of the people, and by growing this part of Missoula has many benefits for the community in the long run. Heidi West talks about the value in this. And this sets us up uh, between the existing water utility property uh, the Sleepy Inn, which was recently inquired, um, it sets the city of Missoula as being a major um, landowner and player in this part of town, which also means that the public will have a greater say of what is going to happen here in the future. And I think that is really invaluable. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think we can even imagine what this will become and what the real benefit is is of this uh, to the future. So I will support it. So the city approved um, eight to one with Sandra Vasecki dissenting. Uh, that doesn't, uh, this does it for a major step in Missoula's growth. Um, uh, some of the committee meetings, they talked about a little bit about this and that. They had a couple interviews, but I'm gonna talk about some parks and conservation where they talked about Lowell School and their partnership with MCPS. So uh, what many people don't know about this is that uh, Parks and Rec and the MCPS school work together on creating a park slash school playground for the kids. And it kind of like, uh, for low school, like the property for MCPS kind of ends where the uh, the basketball court ends, but then uh, the uh, Parks and Recreation uh, basically put in a wooden structure for their, uh, for the uh, playground that w basically has been demolished. Uh, the wooden playground is kind of old hat. It's old school, and they're not, and they're they they're very expensive to kind of maintain because uh, of just the wear and tear of the winter and everything in in Missoula and Montana in general. So they move forward with uh, kind of reconstructing and redoing it. And they and this whole thing was uh, to talk about the plans and the kind of the memorandum of understanding and uh, plans because it's going to be a partnership. Because you know MCPS is not is is a part of the of uh, the city, but not actually. Uh, they're two different entities working together. So, just uh, so basically, you know, they're gonna have a new playground there. Um, it's gonna be uh, modern and everything. Next up, we got. Uh, I just want to say uh, another advertisement. Uh, not really much of an advertisement, but this is kind of big news that. Uh, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci will be appearing in the Montana University of Montana Mansfield Dialogues next Wednesday. Uh, I believe it's on the 
17th and it's going to be at noon so you guys can join the zoom meeting as well as uh, enjoy the live stream on their facebook page and go to mcat.org to video view it on local live live from 12 to 1 p.m um, last Wednesday, the Mansfield Center with the University of Montana hosted folks from all around Montana's government representatives, and this episode was called Rights and Responsibilities in the Time of COVID. Let's kick things off with Justice Jim Nelson. He's a former Supreme Court judge for the state of Montana, and this is what he had to say. That while many patriots and anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers and uh, uh, other self-proclaimed experts are very vocal in expressing their rights, notably their rights to freedom from government interference in their lives and liberty, speech, and to possess guns. Most are clueless about Montana's constitutional imperative, referred to by Professor Johnston, for responsible citizenship. That is under Article 2, Section 3 of the Montana Constitution, uh, with the exercise of inalienable, inalienable rights come, and I quote, corresponding responsibilities, unquote. He went on to uh, support the use of masks and health recommendations as responsible Montanans. A deputy for the Montana County Attorney's Office, Anna Conley, goes on to explain the legality of enforcing mask requirements. Of course, the health officer and the health board have a statutory duty to stop the spread of communicable disease. I've heard a lot about this being a, uh, uh, like a discretionary authority, but it's not. It's a duty with the word shall in state law. This is something that our local folks have to do, whether they want to or not, or whether it's hard or easy. Although these laws are put in place, they are all, by all means, temporary, which means if, if there comes a time when numbers best reflect the community spread, uh, can alter regulations. Uh, also, temporary doesn't mean when you feel like it, just so you know. Uh, Conley went on to the history of COVID and policies, but you already lived them so far. So let's skip ahead to the Montana business owner of Five and Black, Tom Snyder, who's seen many different uh, uh, people from across the state uh, with his businesses in many uh, Montana cities. And this is what he had to say. The thing that's been the most difficult is when you take that choice away, you begin to politicize everything you begin to politicize science. And as soon as you politicize science, you immediately begin to destroy good science. And we've seen this play out over and over again. You do it at a time that science has to be free flowing and it has to be a transparent tool and it has to be something that people can follow and should follow. Um, you know, our federal and state officials, I think have done a really good job, but they've been dealt an impossible task of protecting the dual mandate of public health and economic health. But the harmonization that was referenced before to no fault of theirs was mismanaged from the start. And it Snyder also mentioned that there have been no signs of unity on the ground level in terms of providing a safe and healthy space for his customers and staff. Uh, some people are not uh, abiding to the mask wearing um, and they're kind of trying to figure out how to best serve customers and staff. Uh, Montana House Majority Leader Sue Vinton speaks. So the specific issues that have uh, come to light during this pandemic, increased uh, suicide rates, depression, uh, student learning loss and isolation, income and job loss. As a, as a business owner, I'm keenly aware of the difficulties that many of my fellow small business owners are enduring uh, because of, of the pandemic. We've had permanent business closures, and sadly, we've seen a rise in alcoholism and drug abuse. Many of the reps from Montana have been keenly aware of the economic effects and ultimately are fighting a two-front battle with COVID on one side and the businesses losing money on the other. Uh, from what Montana had, and some folks in the meeting were very pleased with was the distribution of the COVID relief through Montana rather than what the federal government did. Uh, so this is uh, part of the CARES Act. This was a huge thing that uh, went well into, um, um, that kind of got kicked off with our COVID relief checks of $1,200. And Montana was able to uh, uh, kind of slow that down. Um, they said that this was more of a kind of a shotgun approach when it came to giving money to the federal level. But then Montana did a little more easing into it that helped put money into programs through the state of Montana. And I heard as far as... Uh, 
late November, early December that a lot of those programs were funded for a lot of uh, after school um, daycare kind of stuff for a lot of parents. So that was a thing that Montana was moving forward with while many other institutes across the nation were seeing their money kind of drying up as soon as uh, September, October. So Montana did a great job of uh, providing uh, money for services. Um, Jim Nelson comes back with a critique of the Montana legislatures, and this is what he had to say. If our governmental leaders, both federal and state, simply set an example for people, you, I think we, would, we wouldn't have all these problems. I really don't, because people want to follow the people that elect or elected to public office to run the governments. And if if those people don't follow the rules, if those people blow it all off, there's a substantial majority of our citizens who are going to blow it off as well. The president doesn't have to do it. Uh, the House uh, leaders don't have to do it. If these people don't have to do it, why do I have to do it? I don't. It's my right. The former justice also mentioned that this upcoming Bill 75, which will rem remove any liability from businesses owners who spread COVID-19, uh, Sue Vinton responds to this. Thank you. And with all due respect to Justice Nelson, I would, I would say that uh, dealing with this pandemic starts with personal responsibility. Each one of us chooses how we will act responsibly. And I think that the majority of us do to uh, paint uh, legislative leaders as being irresponsible and bad examples is simply not true. Uh, I, I feel as though we are doing the very best we can to deal with some very widespread inconsistencies in dealing with this pandemic. Sue Vinton goes into talking about how each county is different and the folks in the Montana legislation sessions are doing the best they can during these difficult times. And as you uh, saw from Greg Gianforte's uh, uh, comments that he made after signing this uh, bill into action on Wednesday, is that uh, um, <laughs> Montanans are uh, seeing lower numbers and they're ready to move forward. And he's taking this very seriously but he also doesn't think that the Montana's mask mandate should be enforced by the state of Montana and it should be done through local counties and communities if they so choose to do so. So one of the takeaways from this Zoom session was that people in the health departments are doing their best they can. So give them some love instead of hate. Uh, they, uh, they can, they're they doing the best to prevent the spread of disease and they have not closed businesses and have only um, used their services to educate people on better ways to uh, reduce the spread um, and also have answered many questions about uh, concerns with COVID in these COVID times. Also, health departments don't really have time to waste going to each business and to, uh, devote a good chunk of their uh, time making sure everyone's following the rules. Most of the time is spent going towards contact tracing. And if they do have to go to a business, it's all complaint driven. So if there's enough uh, people who complain about certain businesses not following the rules, they'll send a person um, usually after they give them a call. Um, of course, if you are interested in uh, learning more about how uh, the city of Missoula and uh, Basically, uh, basically how the city of Missoula is uh, acting and moving forward and doing a lot of things. You can find out more about your local government by going to ci.missoula.mt.us. Up next is our latest county health department with your latest COVID update. Hi, my name is Cindy Fire and I'm the incident commander for the Missoula City County Health Department's COVID-19 response. Today is Thursday, February 4th, and this is our COVID briefing. We've had 7,872 cumulative positive cases of COVID-19 in Missoula County to date with 17 new cases since yesterday. And we've had 82 deaths associated with COVID-19. Four Missoula County residents and eight out-of-county residents remain hospitalized in Missoula County at this time. We currently have 158 active cases. Those active cases and their identified close contacts remain in isolation and quarantine and are being supported as needed. Our current average incidence per 100,000 people has continued to drop a little and we're now at 19. We have now seen that number remain below the goal of 25 per 100,000 people for about a week and a half. So remember that all of these numbers as well as the graphs and figures associated on our, are associated are on our website at missoulainfo.com. The state of Montana is reporting 96,288 cumulative COVID-19 cases, which is up 383 new cases since yesterday. 
There are now 3,189 active cases with 102 active hospitalizations across the state. And there have been 1,315 deaths related to COVID-19 statewide. The University of Montana has had 625 cumulative UM-associated cases since the beginning of fall semester back in August, with four new cases reported since yesterday. There are currently 11 active UM-associated cases. Missoula County has now administered 16,133 doses of COVID vaccine, with a total of 4,419 people having received both doses of vaccine. We're still in phase 1B of the vaccine rollout plan here in Missoula County because there are approximately 40,000 people in the county who qualify for vaccination under this phase. We asked our Board of Health to help us to prioritize those within 1B in order to group people into tiers that we can more easily serve rather than having all 40,000 people trying to sign up at the same time. We do continue to work through the vaccination coordination team out of the Office of Emergency Management here in Missoula. That team is the coordinating entity for all vaccine coming into Missoula County. The vaccination coordination team manages the website at covid19.missoula.co. They're also helping to create partnerships between vaccine providers and working to increase public knowledge about how to receive a vaccine through the various different vaccine providers across the county. Currently, hospitals and larger clinics are the ones that are receiving vaccine allocations. And the reason for this is that there's significantly more Pfizer vaccine available in the state of Montana than the Moderna vaccine. And the Pfizer vaccine has to be kept in ultra cold storage, which is usually only available at these larger clinical sites. We continue to have clinics at the old Lucky's Market Space in Southgate Mall. Right now, we really rely on our partners to allocate vaccine that they receive for our clinics. And hopefully, as more vaccine becomes available, we'll start getting our own vaccine directly from the state. So that brings me to my last point for today, and that is scheduling. Each organization will have their own way of scheduling um, for a vaccine appointment. So the process that I'm going to talk about right now is really just specific to our clinic at Lucky's. We listened to the feedback that we got from you about the first scheduling software that we used, and we've switched to a new scheduling system called TimeTap. It's much more user-friendly, and while we have now only used it once, we think that we can pretty easily work out any glitches that we might encounter with that software. Our first couple of clinics this week opened up for booking yesterday afternoon, and the 400 appointments that were available filled up in about eight minutes. We know that this is really frustrating, um, but when we consider that thousands of people are eligible for vaccination under the current phase, the appointments are going to go pretty fast. In the future, we do plan to have not only the online signups, but also the ab ability for you to call 258-INFO for assistance in signing up if you don't use a computer or you don't have internet or you just need a little bit of extra assistance. As for signing up for the other clinics, please take a look at covid19.missoula.co for more information there. So that's it for today. I'm just going to keep it really brief and I'll have some more information to share with you on Thursday. As always, you can subscribe to me on YouTube under my name, Cindy Farr, that's C-I-N-D-Y-F-A-R-R. -R. Click the notification bell so that you get notified when additional videos are uploaded. You can follow us on Facebook at the Missoula City County Health Department's Facebook page. We post a lot of great information there. Um, check out our website at missoulainfo.com and call 258-INFO if you're experiencing any symptoms of COVID-19 and would like to get scheduled for a COVID test or if you have other questions about um, COVID-19 or vaccination or anything like that, you can call that 258-INFO number. Um, and I will again talk to you on Thursday. Hey guys, welcome back. I am prepared to talk a little bit more about what's kind of happening within um, the social distancing sessions at the ZAC. The Rocky Mountain Ballet Theater presents a Chinese New Year celebration. And this is going to be live streamed from um, uh, the ZAC. And it's going to be on the ZAC's Facebook page, YouTube page. It'll be on MCAT's local live. You can find out more information going to MCAT.org and also going to ZooTownArts.org. Um, that's one of the things that are happening this weekend. Uh, so far, MCAT's been doing a good chunk of live streams, and we've been help, trying to help as many people uh, in the community with uh, video programs, at-home podcasts, and that kind of stuff. So if you're interested, you can always call us at 542-6228. The area code is 406, but if you're in Montana, you should already know that. If you're not, then you don't belong here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry.
Uh, that's me trying to be funny. All right, so um, there's really uh, not much going on in terms of the library moving forward. I, I did have a conversation with uh, um, the general manager at MCAT, Joel Baird, and he was asking about summer camps. And I kind of told him, it's like, we're kind of up in the air in terms of uh, doing kids' programs at MCAT. Even Spectrum's kind of uh, wondering when the library is going to be open up for a lot of their kids' programs. Um, but for in terms of Zoll and purposes, they did a, a, a meet and greet. Um, the library staff, Hanor, the director, uh, and said that they don't want to be a source of a super spreader uh, facility, so they're doing the best that they can. And so far, uh, everything is kind of going into motion, and it's kind of all of a wait and see. And if anything, in a perfect world, um, if we know for sure, uh, if you don't, the latest we'll probably start advertising is in May for any of our summer camps if we are going to do that. But it all depends upon the venue, whether or not they're willing to open for the public. So that's kind of what's happening in more MCAT news related stuff. But as always, uh, you can go to MCAT.org. So I'm going to end my show, and I wanted to thank you guys for joining me. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Um, stay safe. It's been snowing kind of on and off all week, which is nice, very beautiful, but also drive safe. Uh, and for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. Take care, guys.